Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 17th, 2017. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, part two of our series with Zach Taggart, lab manager at 42 North Brewing in East Aurora, New York. This week, Zach talks about how to isolate and propagate yeast and bacteria. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. Don't forget to get a copy of our brewer's logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can find me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first. Go to our website, basicbrewing.com. Look on the right-hand side of the page. Click on that Amazon logo. It'll take you to Amazon. You can shop to your heart's content. It won't cost you any extra. But you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brewer Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app at Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory. We're on the Stitcher app. We're on Google Play Music. And we're on the iHeartRadio app as well. And if you'll do us the favor of rating us on iTunes, both our audio and video podcasts, and uh, maybe leaving a nice comment there, that will help new listeners find us, and we greatly appreciate you doing that. And finally, if you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And a great thanks to everybody who's done so already. Yesterday, my wife Susan and I bottled my Cascade Pale Ale Test Batch that I brewed uh, in my Mr. Beer fermenter to see if it was contaminated. Um, I'm trying to track down why one of my kombucha soured or kombucha scoby soured beers blew up a couple of weeks ago. Um, I asked Susan what she tasted in a sample of the pale ale, and she said grapefruit. So I'll take that as a good sign. We'll <laughs> there wasn't any uh, scoby floating on the top of the uh, beer uh, after ten days, you know. So maybe that means uh, the uh, fermenter is okay. So we'll see what happens. As the beer conditions, uh, those bottles are in the bathtub. So <laughs> they are waiting <laughs> just in case. Um, my next batch of beer will be a larger batch of a, a similar recipe. Um, I liked how that turned out. Um, in the uh, the smaller batch, the Cascade Pale Ale, instead of adding hops just right at flame out, you know, at the end of the boil, I chilled the wort down a bit uh, before adding that uh, last Cascade addition. Uh, my goal was to chill down to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, or around 82 C, but I missed it, and I hit the 150 degrees Fahrenheit, or around 65 C. But uh, I put the finishing hops in at that temp and let them sit for 15 minutes. So just trying to get the most out of the uh, hop flavor and aroma without, you know, isomerizing any more of those alpha acids to produce more bitterness. I did have more, you know, bittering hops in the beer itself. So it tasted pretty good into the bottle, Uh, so I'm going to step up the volume and uh, brew a five-gallon batch. Crossing fingers for good weather on Monday, when we'll be uh, venturing up into Missouri to watch the solar eclipse. Um, I've been wanting to see a total eclipse for a very long time, so I'm, I'm excited at the prospect, and especially excited that my two boys will have a chance to experience it, too. And there's more good news on the uh, solar eclipse front Uh, In April 2024, there will be another total eclipse that will pass right over northwest Arkansas, right here. So it's something to look forward to. Make your hotel reservations now. (laughs) Uh, Zach and I talked for a good long time, and I want to get to that. But first a word from our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. Pippin's Tap Room is open at High Gravity, and they are serving uh, lower gravity beers right now. But Desiree posted a few days ago that they have gotten zoning approval to brew full-strength beers. So that means the licensing process uh, can proceed to the next step. So that's good news. Uh, Desiree and Dave are brewing beers for the taproom 
on one of their one-barrel, two-vessel electric brewing systems, and it's being controlled by the uh, Werthog EBC 350 controller. And if you go to youtube.com slash highgravitybrew, you can see Dave demonstrate that system. It's very cool. Uh, awesome that you can brew a barrel of beer on such a small footprint. But, of course, uh, High Gravity sells more than just the big systems. They have electric brewery systems all the way back or all the way from five gallons to two barrels and a, a variety of warthog controllers to fit many needs. I love electric brewing. It takes the pain out of propane. So uh, ch- check everything out at family-owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. And if you enter in the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks on your electric brewery system or controller. Uh, high gravity, family-owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. Now let's get into the second part of our conversation with Zach Taggart, lab manager at 42 North Brewing. Zach Taggart, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me, James. We got good response from the first time you were on. Last time you were talking about uh, essentially just looking at our yeast and seeing if it's healthy and seeing how much is there as far as cell count wise. We're going to get into uh, a more complicated sort of sort of a situation in the second half, uh, but we did get some questions uh, from listeners uh, from the first half, and I wanted to address those before we go into it. Um, John from Iowa City, Iowa, said uh, uh, in the first half you spoke about an experience you had with repitching Y East 1968, and how it, eventually you noticed that the beer uh, began to taste off. Uh, John asks, knowing that genetic drift of a yeast population when repitching multiple times is a potential concern, is it possible that the repitched yeast just began to produce more off flavors as it adapted to a somewhat more harsh environment? Uh, Would the testing as described be able to demonstrate that it wasn't relatively healthy? Uh, And is there anything that homebrewers can do to counteract or test for this genetic drift? So do you think that the, the issues that you were having um, with that uh, Y yeast strain, do you think it was genetic drift, or what do you think is going on? Yes, that's a good question. I um, I brought that um, example up because it kind of showed that before you um, engage in these kind of techniques of cell counting and stuff we'll talk about today with plating, you don't really know. Um, and so it could be genetic drift. It could be um, you know contamination. It could be that I was uh, over pitching or under pitching uh, chronically over a period of time. Uh, so without the the microscope, it's tough to say. Now, the things we talked about in the first episode with cell counting, that would help me rule out whether my pitch rates were affecting the flavors. Um, if, if I was say way under pitching, um, I could be getting some, some off esters. Um, if I'm pitching not very viable yeast, and then that could, uh, allow for, um, you know, some fusels or even some contamination to set in before it gets going, um, so the, the cell counting we talked about last time will help you adjust those and address the pitch rate stuff. And today we're going to be talking about um, using media plates and that kind of thing in your home brewery. And that will help you uh, rule out the contamination side. Uh, and we can also talk about what happens if you do have a contamination and trying to get back to your pure culture. But, um, yeah, the, the main point I brought that up was that uh, at that point I had gone through maybe 10 generations of that yeast and I loved it. And then it started to... Um, just not produce the kind of beer that it was uh, previously. Um, and so, but at that point, I just kind of had to dump it because I had no way of knowing what it was and no way of clearing up any any sort of issue with it. Right. Uh, Adam from Maple Grove, Minnesota, uh, writes, is there a way to harvest yeast from a commercial beer that has not been bottle conditioned? So that's tough. Um, I mean, you can definitely shoot for uh, beers that are bottle conditioned. The the tough side with that is that sometimes uh, breweries use a, a bottle conditioning yeast, and so you don't know if you're getting their primary strain or their bottle conditioning strain. Uh, but if you're talking about a beer that is force carbonated, um, it's going to be tough because some breweries will be using centrifuges or filters to get all the yeast out of there. And so there's likely not much you're going to be able to culture up. Uh, if they don't, if they're just cold crashing their their beer, to get it somewhat clear and then they force carb it that way, there might still be some uh, in solution. And if you tried doing, 
you know, very uh, delicate steps, you know, low gravity wort, 10, 20, let's say, um, and very small amounts, maybe start off with, um, you know, 20 milliliters or something in the bottle, you might be able to coax that back. But um, trying to pull yeast out of a, a non-bottle conditioned beer is definitely a challenge. And Adam also asks, uh, the head brewer at the brewery down the street told me I could have some yeast slurry from the fermenter if I bring a sanitized mason jar. Uh, are there any tips for working with this yeast before I use it to ferment beer at home? Do I need to wash it, or can I use it straight away in a starter? Yeah, I, I mean, that's going to be uh, nice, healthy yeast. If they're, um, if they're if you're doing it on harvesting day, it'll probably be shortly after primary, so it's going to have just dropped out uh, if you pull the sample, you can take a look at it in the jar and see if there's debris, depending on where they are giving you the sample, whether it's the bottom of the cone or, or higher up, you'll get um, more or less trube in there. But um, take a look at it. You can use it straight off. You can estimate the amount of slurry. Uh, or if you're doing the cell counts like we talked about last time, you can do a little density count and then just pitch it straight into a beer. Uh, if there is some uh, debris in there, you could just take a portion of it and put that into a starter and prop it up in a, in a cleaner wart. But uh, that that yeast is going to be good to go. Yeah, that's a that's a luxury having a <laughs> having a generous uh, uh, commercial brewer uh, down the street, for sure. Yeah, no, and it's great. You know, especially small breweries love love making uh, building relationships with their community and stuff. And so I think reaching out to your local brewery and showing interest is a, a good way to go about that. And they're the same generally the same kind of strains you'll get from the the labs but you are going to get a nice quantity and it's going to be uh in most cases in pretty good shape so so this time uh we are going to talk about uh last time we talked to, as i said about uh, counting uh your yeast population and, and checking in on its health uh this time we're going to get into some more uh, complicated processes what are we going to talk about this time zach Okay, so today I wanted to kind of dive into using growth media uh, to isolate and propagate cultures, whether they be um, brewer's yeast uh, or uh, wild yeast or even bacteria. Um, so the reason that you would do this in your home brewery is you can, one, if you're maintaining a house culture like we talked about, um, you can do checks to make sure that that's a, a clean culture if you're getting some kind of off flavor. Um, like I did with the the 1968, you can plate that out and uh, you'll be able to see for sure if there's a contaminant in there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, identifying the contaminants once you, if you do have something pop up on a plate, um, especially if you're working with like a mixed culture, some, uh, you know, uh, bacteria are going to be helpful to that, that beer and some that you don't want. So I can give a couple tips on how to um, start looking at what kind of bacteria you're finding in those. Uh, then, as I mentioned before, if you're getting uh, a, con a contaminant in your culture, you can use plates to build that back up and create a pure culture from scratch uh, from individual colonies of, of yeast. Um, and then, you know, finally, I mentioned last time, one of my uh, favorite things is to uh, search out, especially when I go on, go on vacation to new places, I try to find little local breweries that have uh, bottles of cool shift beer or use the beer that uses wild yeast. And then I can use plates to try and uh, pick out and isolate the uh, wild yeast and bacteria in those beers and use them at home. So you can go searching for strains that are only available uh, in these commercial bottles and not from the, the big labs. Yeah, that's cool. It just it definitely adds another dimension uh, to the home brewing process. Uh, now we're we got to buy some more stuff. <laughs> Last time we we got a microscope uh, and uh, the uh, hemo hemo cytometer. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned last time that just uh, thinking of it as a counting grid is is a good way to go about it. It's really um, not as intimidating as it sounds. <laughs> so the, so what do we got to have uh, this time? What do we got to go out and find? All right. So you can, uh, if, if it's something that interests you, you can like kind of test the waters by buying pre-poured plates. Um, you know, if you go on Amazon, you can buy a nutrient agar plate for uh, a pack of 10 for 20 bucks uh, and test it out and see if it's something that you're interested in. Uh, if it's something that you want to build into your, uh, your repertoire, you're going to need a pressure cooker. Uh, and those have a huge range of cost, uh, anywhere from your $30 uh, pressure cooker 
with the little snap on lid to, you know, a couple hundred dollars um, that have a nice regulator on it and that kind of thing. Uh, you, what you essentially want to be able to do, though, is to hold 15 PSI for 15 minutes, and that's going to sterilize anything that you put inside. When you're building up cultures from individual colonies, you're taking a very small amount of um, culture and trying to build it up, and any other contaminants that might be in there are going to be building up alongside it. So the pressure cooker is really important to sterilize your equipment and make sure you're building up just the strains that you want. Yeah, there's a um, difference between sanitization and sterilization. Exactly. Uh, usually, we can get away with sanitizing something, but in something like this, you really need to sterilize and to kill everything. Right, because you're, you know, an individual, I think they say an individual colony is one million cells, and that's just a, a teeny amount. Um, and so you want to make sure that when you're putting that into some wort, that that's the only thing growing, because it won't necessarily be able to outcompete something else with, on that small of a dose. Um, so the, the one thing to look out though, with pressure cookers, you can go on the cheaper end. Um, the, you want to do a little reading though. I've read that some of the cheaper ones, they'll get up to 15 PSI, but they won't necessarily hold it for the duration of those 15 minutes. Mm. It'll kind of fluctuate up and down. Um, and you know, at, in the home setting, that might be just fine. Um, so do a little reading on that, but you can get some, some quality ones that'll, uh, last you a lifetime or you can just grab a, a, a used one off Craigslist and, and give it a shot on your own, but something to, to look out for. Um, all right, so that's the pressure cooker. You're going to need some uh, Petri dishes, and you can get uh, the little dispo packs of the disposable uh, plastic ones. Uh, I tend to, I got a, bunch, a pack of 20 uh, borosilicate plates because then I can reuse them. I just afterwards wash them out, um, get them ready for the next batch, and, and put new media in it. And that way I'm not throwing out a bunch of plastic every time I want to do some new plates. Mm -hmm. um, your media, uh, you, you, we'll talk about media in just a, a minute, um, but there's a broad range of, of stuff you can use to grow up uh, yeast and bacteria cultures. Uh, but in most cases, you'll have like a powdered media that you'll mix up. Uh, and uh, that, you know, I, I get the jugs from Weber Scientific, uh, 500 grams of, of media powder for 30 bucks, and those will last you a long, long time. So it's a, a little investment in the beginning, but then you're, you're good to go once you get your, your setup. And then the, the final thing you'll need is a, what's called an inoculation loop. And that's essentially just a very thin wire with a loop at the end. And that's what you're going to use to spread your culture on the plate. So it, it sounds intimidating, but uh, uh, again, in your presentation uh, for, uh, for HomebrewCon, uh, you made a, another video uh, on this process um, uh, showing, you know, how you you make the, the plates and, and all that. Um, and it doesn't doesn't look complicated once you once you see it done. Uh, no. And I'll uh, I'll upload that that video for you and send you a link so that your listeners can check that out. It's it's really uh, quite easy. You do it, do it once or twice and then um, you've got it down. I mean, essentially what you're doing is you are mixing the powder into some water in a little beaker, uh, just enough so it d dissolves. You put that liquid in the pressure cooker with your plates. Um, you hit that with uh, 15 PSI for 15 minutes, take it out, and then pour into the individual plates out and let them cool. So, um, you know, the looking at these Petri dishes and media and that kind of stuff can sound intimidating, but uh, once you take a, a look at the video, you'll see it's, it's something you can easily do just uh, in a given evening. Once you have the process down, and the uh, the AHA has tweeted that uh, the the HomebrewCon presentations are out there uh, on the web for those members of the the Homebrewers Association who want to go and check those out. So if you didn't get to go to HomebrewCon this year, uh, the presentations are are out there. Or if you did get to go and and <laughs> couldn't be five <laughs> places at once, uh, you know, to to attend the sessions, uh, uh, that stuff is out there. Um, Absolutely. So what are the different um, types of media that we're, that we're looking at? Okay, so um, to start off, you could just do a general growth media. And the, the one that labs use um, as the low-level basic one is called YPD. Um, and that sounds complicated, but it's just uh, yeast extract, uh, peptone, and dextrose. And so essentially what it is is you're just giving sugar and nutrients to the yeast. So if you wanted to do that at home, you could just... Uh, get a little dry malt extract uh, and cook it up with a little yeast nutrient, and you basically have your homemade YPD. 
Hmm. Um, and you know, I've done that at home. It works great. The, with growth media, the issue is that you're going to be able to grow everything. Um, so if there's bacteria in there, it's going to grow. If there's yeast in there, it's going to grow. Um, so it, what you, you have to do a little more to isolate things, but it's really easy to make if you are, uh, if you have a little dry malt extract at home and yeast nutrient, all you have to do is get a little agar to solidify it and uh, you're good to go. Um, so that will grow everything. There are a bunch of different kinds of media that can help you isolate things, which is kind of cool. The first is a class called differential media. And all it is is basically um, media that has dye in it and different strains and different um, organisms will take up the dye at different rates. So let's say you have um, a culture that has a blend of yeasts and you streak that out on the plate. One of the sets of yeast will appear white, let's say, and the other one will have a slight green tint. So you'll be able to see them apart. Hmm. Um, and you can do the same thing with the if there's bacteria on the plate. Uh, and then the third class, so you have growth media, differential media. The third class is selective media. And what that's going to do is that will have um, oftentimes a lot of, uh, some form of antibiotic in it. So it'll kill off a, a specific population so that you can let others grow. So there are some that will kill off the bacteria. There are some that will kill off the yeast. Um, there are some that will kill off um, just brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces, but it won't kill off things like Britannomyces. Hmm. So those are kind of cool. You can go into the um, the lab, uh, scientific lab sites and pick out what kind of media you like if you want to really get into it, uh, depending on if you want to um, isolate wild stuff or if you're just trying to pull out um, a yeast strain out of a mixed culture. Uh, lots of options there. But again, if you're getting started, just go for a little wart and agar and you're, you're uh, already in the game. <laughs> so what do we do with these plates? I mean, once we got our, our you got the growth media that we like on there, how do you, how do you use them? All right. So, I mean, basically what you have is just a little Petri dish and it's got uh, a jelly like coating on it. Uh, you're going to want to put your culture on there. Uh, now when I'm at work and I'm doing contaminant testing, I do something called a pour plate. And what that is, is I'm taking a very specific amount of, uh, the, either the beer or the, uh, slurry and, uh, pouring that onto the plate and spreading it out. And the reason I do that is so that I can tell if any bacteria comes up, I can say, oh, I got three colonies in 100 microliters. So I can tell exactly how much um, of the contaminant is in there. If you're doing things like isolating and propagating, what you want to do is called a streak plate. And uh, all that is is taking your inoculation loop, putting a little bit of your culture on the plate, and then spreading that across the plate um, so that you're spreading the, the, the sample out to, so that it can pop up individual colonies along. So there's pattern, you can look them up online, there's different patterns you can do, but essentially you do a little scratch and then kind of spread that out across the rest of the plate um, so that you can separate the colonies and be able to pick those out. So how hard is it to get a, like a sample of beer or a sample of uh, slurry that is 100% clean, you know, that doesn't have any bacterial contamination? Is, it, is that easy to do or is, or is, it, uh, or is it hard? Oh no, not hard at all. I mean, if you're if you're using good sanitation, um, you uh, you'll get most clean samples. I mean, at, at work I um, do contaminant testing, but a man only uh, a very rare case will I actually have stuff pop up in the beer. You know, so in most cases the pH and the alcohol are gonna uh, kill things off. Um, but in those cases that you do, you want to make sure that the contaminant is in the beer and not just in the air around you. So that's, um, I don't know if I talked about it the first time, but you can set up next to, let's say, uh, your gas stove, turn on the, the flame, and that'll get a little bit of uh, uh, heat rising above your plate so that it's keeping out anything from falling on top of your plate. You want a kind of a clean environment to do your streaking on um, so that you know that it's, the contaminant is not coming from the air, it's coming from your, your sample. Um, so, you know, I do it at, next to my gas stove at home, but if you have a little, um, gas burner or even a propane torch, you can just turn that on next to your little setup and that'll create like, kind of like a drift around your work area. So that stuff isn't floating into your, your space. What about a ventilation hood over, uh, over, you know, like at home, people have yeah. ventilation hoods over their stoves. Will that be sufficient? Yeah. You know, I do the, I would do the ventilation, uh, hood and then the heat on the gas stove and you'll be you'll be set i mean in labs they have these big sealed off um cabinets that are 
basically a, a fancy ventilation hood. So yeah, that would definitely help out. Um, you know, the, the bare minimum is that you don't want drafts in your room. So close the windows, close the doors. Um, you know, I, uh, try to make sure that my kids aren't going to be walking through or the dog's not going <laughs> to come up and check out what I'm doing. Um, you know, we're at home, uh, if we make a mistake, it's not a big deal. So I think you just do your best is to keep a, a clean environment. And I have, if you go back and look at my presentation, I have a list of things you might want to consider um, to, to get there. And there's also in the um, the yeast book, uh, Chris White's book, he has a, a good list there of how to set up your, your home lab. Um, but, you know, very minimal things you can do to just ensure that your uh, the results you're getting are from your sample. Now, we've got our plates and we've either flooded them or we've uh, we've streaked them. So how long is it going to take uh, to see results and what conditions do we have to keep those in? Okay, so you want to um, try and keep it in kind of a warm area. Um, in general, the yeast are going to propagate best at around 85 degrees. Um, so you want to, the, it will propagate at lower temperatures. And, you know, at work I have an incubator. At home I don't have one. So I, in the wintertime, I put it, I have a little closet um, in our living room that has a heat vent going through it. So it's pretty warm in there. And so I put my plates on a little shelf in there um, and that keeps the temperature up. Uh, basically the warmer temperature will uh, encourage the yeast to, to pop up quicker. Um, and gen in general, the brewer's yeast is going to show up in, you know, like one to three days. Uh, wild yeast like Britannomyces tend to take a little bit longer um, and bacteria as well. But um, what it comes down to is the, the cooler it is, the longer it's going to take. So it will show up if you do it at room temperature. It's just going to take a few more days. Uh, the other things that you want to look out for are humidity. If you're in a very humid environment, you could uh, be encouraging the growth of mold on your plate, which will then contaminate your sample. Uh, so that's something to think about. If you're in a really dry environment, uh, your plates will dry out faster. Uh, so they'll start to shrivel and crack and that kind of thing. So you generally want just kind of like mid-range humidity. Uh, I know we don't tend to have a lot of control over that, so uh, just something to look out for. And I'm assuming that these these plates are covered, right? They're not just <laughs> they're not just yes. open to the air. <laughs> yep, yep. So they have a lid that just kind of sits on top, um, and you don't need to tape them down or anything. Just a a loose lid fitting on top, and a closed environment that's warm will will do the trick. And I have and to you say, know, you for, can, our, for our metric people, uh, 85 degrees Fahrenheit is around 29 30, or 30, yeah, 30 Celsius. Yep. So, okay. There you and, go. And, you know, I was looking <laughs> on, uh, before we started talking, I just took a quick look on Craigslist. If you look up um, egg incubators, you can usually, if, especially if you're living near a rural environment, you can find uh, egg incubators for, you know, under 50 bucks. And those will, will do the trick as far as uh, keeping a nice, warm uh, environment for you. Cool. Uh, now uh, we move. We, we move on. We we bought a uh, a microscope the first time for for uh, cell counting and uh, you know looking looking at the health of our cells. Uh, but the microscope that uh, that you're going to recommend is the minimum is a bit better than the one that you that you recommended for the first one, right? Yes. So when we were doing the cell counting, we were using a 400x magnification. If you want to start getting into looking at uh, Bertanomyces or uh, Lactobacillus, Pediococcus, uh, you're going to need uh, a thousand X uh, scope. And uh, something to look out for: one of your uh, listeners wrote in and asked a couple questions about a scope. There are some, uh, and I might have mentioned this the first time, that have a 20x ocular, and they use that to to reach a thousand X. You want to try to avoid those because what that's doing is that's taking a lower objective. The objective is the lens that's closest to your sample and an ocular is the one you look in and together they need to make a thousand. So what you really want is one that's a hundred on the objective and 10 on the ocular. If you have a 20 ocular, it means your objective is uh, not as good. And so it's just making the image bigger, but not clearer. Hmm. Uh, so when you look for those scopes, you want a hundred X objective and a 10 X ocular to make your thousand. Um, and they're oftentimes labeled as they're called oil immersion. Uh, because when you're doing it at this um, uh, level of magnification, what you do is you basically just drop a little bit of oil so that the image contacts the lens and it makes it clear. Um, sounds complicated, but it's, it'll be in the directions for your scope. It's really easy. 
<laughs> and and Tony was the listener that uh, he actually sent you a link uh, to a, a, a microscope on Amazon and said, "How about this one?" <laughs> so you were yeah. you were kind enough to take the time and and uh, kind of walk him through the the process of finding you know a, a good scope. So I know he uh, Tony appreciates that. Oh yeah, and he was you know getting in the. Uh, I love to hear people getting ready to start their breweries and looking at uh, lab stuff right off the bat. So he was, he said he was going to start up like a two barrel brewery or something and already looking at scope. So I think that's a, it's a good start for him. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah. Now how do we, what do we do with this stuff? I mean, we've got, we've got these plates and we've got these colonies on the plates, right? Uh, yes. What do we, how do we know what we're looking at and what do we do with this stuff? <laughs> All right. So you're going to, you're going to take a look at your plate and you're going to see lots of little round um, colonies forming on it. In, in general, um, your yeast are going to be white and opaque and round. So they're going to be the creamy white color, kind of like the color that you see when you have a slurry. Um, and so those will be easy to pick out. Uh, bacteria come in a range of different uh, colors and textures and that kind of thing. Um, they tend, to, the one thing that does tend to give them away is they often have a slimy appearance. So you can have white bacteria on your plate, but it'll um, look kind of like mucus. It'll have like a shiny coating to it. Mm. And that's a giveaway that that's probably a bacteria, whereas the yeast are going to be more creamy. Um, and then mold uh, is pretty, pretty when there are larger colonies, they're pretty easy to identify um, by the eye because you'll see that hairy um, texture to it. Once you get those under the scope, you'll be able to see those. It, you know, small colonies can be hard to identify, but when you get them under the scope, you can see those big, long um, hyphae, which are the the hairs, and that's the giveaway for that. But those are the, the three main things you'll look for. So if you're just dealing with the yeast, you want to see nice, creamy, white colonies on there. Um, and if you do get some bacteria, uh, what you do, what you can do is you can put those under the scope and take a look. And under the microscope, you'll have um, yeast, which will be like we talked about last time, nice big round cells. Um, wild yeast are usually uh, about half the size of those, or even smaller, but they'll still be uh, round cells. Sometimes they're ellipsoid, um, but generally look similar to the brewer's yeast cells that we uh, use all the time. And the bacteria then are going to be into a couple classes. You'll have uh, rods, which is your things like lactobacillus. Uh, and it just looks like a little uh, pill-shaped uh, object under the scope. And then you'll have cocci, which would be things like pediococcus. And those will be a round cell, uh, similar to the yeast, but it's going to be so, so small. That's why you need that 1,000 uh, X uh, magnification. And then the molds, as I said earlier, will have, will have some round cells, but they'll have these big um, kind of fibrous uh, cells coming out. And so they're easy to spot. So we know we don't want mold in our beer, right? We... <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, but we you know we have talked about lactobacillus and pediococcus and things like that. How can you tell, uh, you know, when you're culturing up bacteria, uh, which we generally all our life have uh, you know been told to keep out of our food and food products? How can you tell the stuff that's that's good for brewing, and how can you tell the stuff that's not going to hurt us? So um, to do that, all you need is something called a gram stain kit, and that you can get, you know, you can pull those off Amazon for $30. It'll come with four little solutions that you can use um, to help identify. So uh, most bacteria is classified as either gram positive or gram negative. Um, and essentially what that means is uh, the gram positive cells uh, and gram negative cells have something on the outside, a, a compound on the outside of their cell membrane. The gram positive ones have a, a more of it, and so when you put dye into it, it can retain that dye. Whereas the gram negative ones, uh, you put dye in it and you wash it with a little alcohol, and that dye is going to wash out. Um, so then you can look under the microscope and differentiate those. The gram um, positive ones will appear purple. The gram negative ones will will appear pink. Um, and so I can walk you through that that process if if that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, which one do we want? <laughs> which one do we okay. want to avoid? Good. <laughs> good, good question. So, in general, the the ones that are that you're going to be using in brewing uh, wild beers are gram positive. That's going to be your lactobacillus, lactobacillus pediococcus, that kind of thing. The gram negative ones, if you get one, uh, is going to be a sign that there's something in there that you don't want. 
Um, that could be things like acetic acid, bacteria, enterobacter, that kind of thing. Um, so you, if you're doing your gram stains, you want to see purple for sure. Um, <laughs> and so when you get that kit, all you're, you're going to get this four solutions. You get a crystal violet, uh, a grams iodine, you get your little alcohol wash, and then a saffronin. And, and crystal violet's your purple stain, saffronin's your pink stain. Um, and basically what you do is you stain it all purple at first. You put a little of your second solution, grams iodine, in there to fix that on there. You rinse it with alcohol. Your uh, gram positive ones are going to stay purple but that purple is going to be washed out of the gram negative ones. And then finally you put the saffronin on there to to stain it pink so that your um, gram uh, negative ones are easier to see. They'll pop up as pink rather than being clear. Hmm. Um, And so once you have that, um, you know, you can combine that with your other observations. And if, if this is something that interests you, go check out the, um, the presentation because I have a lot more details on how to work on identifying what you found. Um, But if you look at the shape, you know, is it a uh, rod or is it a, a coxi? Uh, is it uh, in chains or, or look, how is it grouped up under the microscope? Uh, is it gram positive, negative? Uh, in the presentation, I also go over the catalase test, which is basically just putting a drop of hydrogen peroxide in it and seeing what happens. Um, so there's a bunch of different little things you can do to kind of categorize it. You won't know for sure what you have. Um, unless you send it to a lab and get it sequenced, but you can narrow it down. Um, I know we had an issue with one of our barrels uh, at work. Uh, it was developing a little bit of um, nail polish remover kind of smell to it, mm. uh, which is a sign of uh, ethyl acetate. And so we wanted to know, is this just, um, it was a sour beer. So is this just the pedococcus and the Brett interacting to make this, or is this some other contaminant? Uh, and so I looked at it under the scope, and uh, sure enough, it was a, a short uh, gram-negative rod. And so, oh, that's, that can't be pediococcus because pediococcus is going to be round. Um, and so it told us that we had something else. And it turned out it was uh, acetobacter. Um, but just taking these little, little signals of what you see on the plate, what you see under the scope, can help you narrow down what this might be. Now, we've, uh, we've, we've gotten either our, our commercial sample – uh, from a bottle, or we've uh, you know set out wort uh, out out in the environment to collect these uh, these interesting uh, critters, uh, as some people call them, and and so we've we've isolated some some strains uh, that we're curious about, and we want to uh, to grow up uh, and use uh, in our beers. Where do we take this from here? How do we how do we make this these little bitty samples into something that we can brew with? Okay, so uh, well, let's say you are you have your house culture, and uh, you've gotten some kind of contamination, or you've, uh, like you said, pulled uh, a wild capture, um, and you want to be able to isolate just that yeast. Um, you're you're going to be able to you're going to want to pick that colony off the plate and put it into some wort. But you again, like we said earlier, it needs to be a sterile environment for it. So here again, you're going to use your pressure cooker. And all you need to do, you're stepping up, is uh, autoclavable test tubes. And these are real cheap. Just a test tube with a cap on it. And you want to make sure that when you go on Amazon and you look for test tubes that it's autoclavable. Otherwise, you'll have the problem I did with having a kitchen that stinks of melted plastic <laughs> and your, your wife complaining about what's going on in there. So. <laughs> um, what, basically, what the autoclavable, they're a different kind of plastic. It's more durable. And then it has a silicone ring on the inside so that you can seal it off. And that's, um, you know, heat resistant at the, the temperatures you'll be working. So uh, essentially what you're doing is you're taking your test tubes, uh, you fill them up with a little uh, low gravity wart, you pressure cook them, and now you have these sealed little capsules that you can put colonies into. And I just have a, a little beaker in my fridge with these tubes ready to go, um, you know, do like 10, 15 of them at a time and just keep them in there and you'll have a little sterile test tube of a wart so that when you... Uh, want to pick a colony off a plate, you pop it in there, screw the cap back on, give it a little shake uh, every now and then, and pretty soon you'll start to see a little foaming on there. Hmm. Um, because you really want your, uh, the colony is such a small amount of yeast, you want to start real slow and building it up. Um, and so the lowest uh, lowest end you're going to want to work with is, you know, like 15 to, to 30 milliliters at a time. And then you can step up from there once you see activity. For the same reason, you don't want to underpitch your beer. You don't want to underpitch your 
teeny tiny starters. Right. Or, or overwhelm it with too much. Um, so yeah. So just starting off, starting off slow with low gravity, um, and no hop work, you know, that'll, it'll start building it up. If, uh, if you're finding, you're looking at your plate and there's a decent amount of contaminant on there or bacteria on there, you can take, uh, one or two colonies off of there and restreak it onto another plate to try and uh, purify it a little bit more. Hmm. If you're worried that your your inoculation loop might be touching the colony next to it that's bacteria, yeah, pull a little bit of that off, restreak it, and on your next plate, you're going to have a lot more yeast and a lot less bacteria. So you can do some restreaking to try and purify it, or like we talked about earlier, the uh, selective or differential media helps out there as well. And uh, how do we, I mean, can we, can we tell, you know, if it's by looking at the colonies on the, on the plate, uh, you know, like if you're collecting a sample from the wild, uh, can you look at yeast colonies on the, on the plate and, and are there indications that that, that those would be good for brewing or, uh, or do you have to like do a, a test batch to, to actually test the properties? Uh, I mean, I would definitely as you're growing up, do a test batch just to make sure you got the colony that you thought you were wanted to get. But there are some uh, guidelines on when you're picking these colonies because you're going to see when you do a streak plate, you're going to see tons of little circles all over your plate. And when you want to select those, there's a question in your mind, you know, which ones do I pick? Um, so in general, you want to pick ones that are medium sized. Um, the real teeny ones are could be what's called a respiratory mutant. Uh, real big ones could be uh, a colony that's enveloped another colony and they're fighting for resources. So you really just want one that's isolated and is a medium size. Uh, it's also good to make sure they have a nice crisp edge, uh, especially if you're dealing with a, a lab strain. They're going to be nice, crisp brown circles. Wild yeast tend to have uh, a more uh, a granulated uh, border, but uh, for the lab yeast, they're going to be nice and crisp. Uh, any, any, basically any cells that look or colonies that look irregular, you don't want to choose if they're darker, let's say, uh, if they have an off color, um, and, uh, you know, avoid areas that have contaminants close by bacteria is really small in those colonies, uh, when they first start are basically invisible to the eye. So, you know, make, do yourself a favor and just pick colonies that are away from where your contaminants might be. And then again, you can restreak if you need to. Hmm. And we can uh, we can either uh, go we can go two directions we can propagate this up into uh, a pitchable uh, amount of yeast or we can you know essentially bank this and put it in the in the fridge right or in the in the it, save it for fu for future when you want to 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 propagate it up right right so yeah so we can get into the yeast banking I would uh, propagate propagate it up a little bit more before you start thinking about banking it. Um, I would tend to, to bank uh, slurry that's been on a, a yeast starter and has a nice, big, healthy density to it. Um, but, you know, like we said with the um, 1968 example uh, earlier, if I had, uh, you know, banked that culture uh, in my freezer previously, then once it starts to go off, I could just go back to that bank and prop it up again. Mm -hmm. um, and yeast banking is, like, super easy. If, if you don't get into any of the plating stuff, have your hand at yeast banking because uh, really easy, doesn't take a lot of, um, you know, expertise. And then you can have these uh, stored cultures in your freezer that you know are pure that you can prop up anytime a culture goes bad. Um, so to do this, you know, all you need is you need your pressure cooker again. Um, you'll need uh, glycerin. There's actually, there's two ways to do it. Uh, there's slants and then there's the glycerin tubes. A slant is basically a petri dish in a test tube. So you're going to have like a an agar kind of solution in your test tube, and you'll have uh, it tipped to the side to make it so that it has a, a big surface area, and you'll streak out your colonies on top. The glycerin, I find, is much easier, and I think if you're going in as an entry level, it's the way to go. Essentially what you're doing is you're adding uh, glycerin to your slurry uh, of yeast and water so that it – reduces the amount of crystals that form uh, as it starts to freeze and they don't burst the, the yeast cells. Mm. Um, and so all you need is your, your pressure cooker, your test tubes, and your glycerin. And you want to do a solution of about 15% glycerin. You can go up to, 
you know, you could go as high as 50, but then you start affecting the viability of the yeast. So a general rule of thumb is 15%. Um, when you get your uh, glycerin, you can get it from a, even like a health food store or Amazon. Um, it'll say food grade, 100% glycerin or 99.9% .9 pure. Uh, it's going to be like syrup. So the first step is to uh, dilute that out a little. So I make a little 50-50 uh, solution of glycerin and water. Um, and then I fill up my tubes. Uh, you know, in that case, since you're doubling the, the volume there with water, that's going to want to be 30% full. So you get your 15% glycerin in there. Uh, pop those in your pressure cooker for 15 minutes. And now those tubes are ready to uh, get slurry at any time. So next time you have a starter that you're overbuilding and you have a little excess you want to save, fill the rest of that tube up with slurry and, and put that in the, the freezer. And that's going to be good to go uh, next time you need to go back to a pure culture. Wow. And, and then how do you revive that? How do you, once you've got your sample frozen and, and say you want to brew a specific type of beer that calls for that specific yeast, how do you, uh, what are the steps that you, you got to do to, uh, to use it? So you want to, when you're doing the freezing and unfreezing, you want to do it slowly. Uh, the, the more you can slow down the process, the easier it's going to be on that, that culture. Because being frozen is a, a pretty harsh environment for it. Uh, so uh, a tip going in is that you take, once you fill up your test tube with the slurry, uh, put that in the fridge for a couple of days to cool that down to fridge temp, and then put it in your freezer um, so that it has a nice transition in. And then you can do the same thing coming out. Take your tube out of your freezer don't use it right away you know pop it in the fridge for a day or two to let that sort of uh slowly raise up in temperature uh and when i when i'm talking about a freezer you uh want to you be using like a chest freezer the freezers that are attached to fridges tend to be um so that they don't build up with ice they tend to cycle between being frozen and being just under frozen so that the ice melts off mm. um but those swings in temperature are not going to be as good for your uh, for your yeast. You can do it and you can insulate your container real well, but they'll be much better off in a, in a chest freezer that's going to maintain a steady temperature. I guess um, you could try to surround your samples with ice or something to, to kind of stabilize the temperature if you don't have access to a chest freezer. Exactly. Yep. You can put ice packs in there. I've heard of people putting uh, it in like a alcohol select vodka solution just to maintain that temperature. But uh, the, the swings are what's going to reduce your viability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing to, to watch out for, and it's kind of funny, the first time I did it, I made a bunch of tubes all at once, put them in the freezer. Um, you know, a couple of weeks later, really excited to like check them out and pulled one out and it was frozen solid. I thought, oh my gosh, I just ruined all this, <laughs> all these samples of yeast, but they will freeze at 15% glycerin. They will freeze solid. It's not going to stop the freezing. Um, as I said, it's just going to, uh, slow down the, the process of freezing so that the crystals that form are much smaller and don't rupture your yeast. Hmm. So if you see a frozen tube, don't worry. Thaw it out slowly and it'll be, it'll be fine. Uh, and then, you know, the last tip for, for having a, a yeast bank is just keeping a good inventory. Uh, keep a little, um, you know, in your brewing log, keep a little list of what, what's in there, uh, what the source was, what generation it is, uh, and, you know, that way you're not going in and out of your chest freezer, opening up, exposing it to warm temperatures and then sealing it back up. You'll know what's in there uh, whenever you need it. You can just go and pull that out uh, without disturbing the rest of your stock. Uh, but, you know, again, take a look online. Uh, there are great videos on there about about freezing yeast. And it's once you see it, the process, you'll, you'll say, to yourself, oh, I can do that. That's not a problem. And it's, you know, one of the easier lab based things you can do in your home. And then from there, it's a, it's just a, a matter of making a series of pro progressively larger starters. That's right. Just like when you're building off the plates, you know, you'll start off small. Um, you know, if your if your tubes are, um, you know, let's say twenty milliliters of slurry, you know, start it off in in a hundred milliliters of wort of ten twenty, and then after that, after it's kind of starting to show activity and reviving, then you can bump it up. You can do 1040. Um, you can do steps of like five times the volume, 10 times the volume. Uh, and, you know, once it's after the first step, I find they're, they're pretty reinvigorated and ready to go. So just go easy on that first step. And then after that, you can build up as you would normally. 
So it takes a little preparation and a little planning ahead. Uh, <laughs> a, yeah. little, a little time, but, you know, uh, the spur of the moment brewers may may need to reconfigure their, uh, their activities, but uh, <laughs> it should be well worth it, I guess. Yeah, and, you know, I... Like I said, I tend to take one evening. Oh, this will be my pressure cooking evening. And I make a bunch of little wort tubes and I make a bunch of little glycerin tubes. And then they're in the fridge for when I need them um, so that uh, when I have a good starter going, I can pour a little yeast in there for freezing. Or when I have a plate that's ready, I can just pop that out of the fridge. And if those tubes are sealed and ready to go, they'll last for quite a while without without any worries. Well, cool. Any any last tips that we didn't talk about or anything anything that we've we've left on the table that we need to talk about no i mean once you once you've tried these things out they become really easy and then it's all about just having fun and hunting down uh the the cool cultures that you want to find i am currently working on uh a culture that i got off of organic strawberries from our local farm Mm. uh and you know it's pretty cool to think that i'll be able to brew with that something that uh, we'll have a profile that will be pretty unique in itself. Um, and, you know, keep in mind that when you're dealing with wild cultures, you're going to get lots of uh, fails before you find one that's that's good. Mm. Most yeast that are out there floating around uh, or um, on leaves or on fruit are going to not necessarily produce the profile that you want or not going to attenuate the sugars that you want. So uh, it's going to take some some trying, but you know, if you work at it, you can you can get your own unique culture uh, out of nature and, and have a beer that's unique just to you, which is pretty cool. Yeah. You know, and also hunt down those beers that you love and that you can't get yeast from in the banks and pull that yeast out and use it in your, your home brewery and to make something really uh, that satisf- satisfies your palate. Yeah, Kevin Welch from uh, Boom Island Brewing Company was talking about traveling through Belgium with his uh, little, you know, with his pockets full of little vials to, <laughs> 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 to take samples. Yeah, back there was home. a uh, there was a picture of uh, at the uh, homebrew con of uh, Jeff Mello from uh, Bootleg Biology, or actually one of his one of his buddies, you know, outside of the convention pulling flowers off the the bushes. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it can it can really become a fun part of the of the hobby. I tend to, you know, some people really get into the recipe building and um, you know, and in, into the different varieties of hops and that kind of thing. But you can also spin off and get really into the the yeast. Uh, and I think it's it's a lot of fun and it gives a lot of character to your beer. Well, very very cool, very inspirational. Um, I I appreciate it again. This has been fun again, and uh, we'll put the I put the, actually put the video. Uh, on uh, basicbrewingradio.com uh, in the description of this episode last or last time when we talked. Uh, and uh, it's going to be on YouTube as well. And, and uh, your brewery, 42 North, has a, a channel on YouTube that people should search for and, and find the videos there as well. Uh, and uh, also, if you're a member of the American Homebrewers Association, go to the uh, HomebrewCon website and uh, search out uh, Zach's presentation along with uh, all the rest of them there so lots of good yeah, information and, and I'll, I'll send you the link for not only the making media plates but i also have one for gram staining if that's something that interests people um you know the quick process video and there again there's tons out there um so don't feel constrained to mine but um yeah check it out if you guys have questions and just just let me know awesome thanks zach yeah thank you james thanks for having me on well, thanks again to Zach. He makes it all sound and look easy. And uh, as I said, you can go to the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com to check out Zach's videos or search for 42 North on YouTube to find their channel. And it's worth a look, especially if you want to uh, get into this kind of thing. Uh, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcast. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. You can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can find our logbooks where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. 
Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. And thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Mad Monkey Coffee Capsules, Swing and Bold, 48 count, and Eclipse Glasses, CE Certified Safe Solar Eclipse Glasses. Got me some of them, too. Uh, <laughs> so excited. Thanks again. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.